Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Methodist Church, Dangerfield. So I'm glad you could be here, those of you here in attendance and those watching on television. I have uh, one announcement. The SPRC will meet Tuesday at 6 p.m. Uh, do you have any other announcements? Well, be, be sure and check your, the announcements that are written in the bulletin. Uh, and that's all I have. Please join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin and on the monitors. We are called to be God's children. God's love has been poured on us through Jesus Christ. Fear and doubt are gone. Joy and celebration ring in our hearts. Come, let us raise our voices in song. Let us offer our hearts and souls to God in prayer. stand and join in singing our opening hymn, I Stand Amazed in the Presence. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4, or whatever they put on the monitor. <laughs> <laughs> Please remain standing and join me in the Apostles' Creed, page 881 in your hymnal, and also on the monitors. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We'll come to the time in our service where we give our concerns, our prayers, and our joys. We all want to remember Paul and Linda Pecola. Uh, Paul will be scheduled for surgery within the next two or three weeks. They're awaiting confirmation from the doctors. Uh, still want to be in prayer for both of them and uh, claim that victory through the surgery. Yes. And continue to lift Marcy up as she still continues to build her strength after her chemo treatments and all of that. And Casey's Aunt B is doing well after having some chemo and radiation treatments. And we're proud and thankful to God has answered those prayers. And for those of you who may not know, Ricky Bird had a triple bypass on Friday. He's doing quite well. Uh, so he'll be still in the hospital for a few more days, I would suggest. But doing well. Came through the surgery very well. Any other Prayer concerns? Okay, Sandy. My daughter Trisha has the flu. I was with her all last week and now she has the flu. I said, I'll pray for Trisha. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that, should I? <laughs> so Sandy's dishing out the flu. <laughs> Take Michelle that back. Y'all can get what I just said. Huh? Michelle, Michelle. Okay. Great. Any others? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most grateful Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings of life. Lord, we thank you for your Son who gave the ultimate sacrifice that we might have eternal life. Lord, this day we've lifted up names and Lord, we ask and praise you for the answers. We thank you for the victory and these healings that have been asked for. We thank you, Lord, for compassion that we might show to one another. And Lord Jesus, we just thank you for this church, this congregation. And Lord, we ask now that you lift us all. Let us be ever mindful of thy presence in our lives and live accordingly. So we ask this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and join me in the morning prayer. Blessed Savior, you keep showing up for us in unexpected places. When we face uncertainty, you are there. When we worry about tomorrows, you are there. And even in the doubt-filled lonely hours, you are there. Hear our prayer of thanks in constant love which convinces us to sing aloud. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and deliver us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated.
as our ushers come forward this morning. Let's go to God in prayer. Mighty and gracious God, we thank you for the blessings that you've given unto us. God, we praise you for the rain. We praise you for the, for the clouds. We praise you for the sun. We praise you for all of those who are around us, who comfort us, who provide the blessings unto us. God, we praise you for this day and every day. And we give back to you at this time. Give back to you so meagerly, but that you use so mightily. May these gifts that we give now today, may they go to share and show your love, mercy, grace, and forgiveness now and forever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen, amen. and amen. Let's remain standing and sing our gospel hymn, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. We're going to do one, two, and four. Number 462. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus and to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise and to know I was drifting away on life's pitiless sea And the angry waves threatened my ruin to be 
When away at my side there I dimly decried a stately old vessel and loudly I cried. Ship ahoy, ship ahoy, and loudly I cried, ship ahoy. Was the old ship of Zion the sailing along? All aboard her seemed joyous, I heard their sweet song. And the captain's kind ear, ever ready to hear, caught my wail of distress as I cried out in fear. Ship ahoy, ship ahoy, as I cried out in fear, ship ahoy. The good captain commanded a boat to be lord, and with tender compassion he took me on board. And I'm happy today, all my sins washed away in the blood of my Savior, and now I can say, Bless the Lord, bless the Lord. From my soul I can say, Bless the Lord. O oh, soul sinking down neath sin's merciless wave, the strong arm of our captain is mighty to save. Then trust him today, no longer delayed, board the old ship of Zion and shout on your way. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, shout and sing on your way, Jesus saves. Amen. Amen. We have no children under 30 out here, I don't believe so. Well, Skip, and I would like to introduce you to Reverend Kelly uh, Inman, who will be bringing our message today. Appreciate it. Well, that just gives me more time to preach, right? So y'all buckle in, get you some water, we'll get ready to go. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just being serious. Now, come on, let's go. We, uh, I, I, uh, I don't know how many know... I know that there are those who I met with this past week. Was it this past, was it this past week? Week before, it was two weeks ago. That's right. Um, they kind of got to know me, uh, but I, I currently coach and teach at Cooper. For those of you who are listening online, I said that correctly. It's Coop like book, not Coop like book. So, Cooper. And so, been there for a couple of years. Uh, my wife and I have been married for 28 years. We have two children, Kyle, who's 27, and Kaylee, who is 24. Yes, we are all K's, and we will answer to all of them. So, depending on what time of day it is and what you're calling us to. If you're calling us to lunch or dinner, you can call us whatever you want to call us, as long as you don't forget that. But this morning, we are uh, going to walk through Acts chapter 3. I'm going to back it up of, uh, just a second for, uh, to verse 11 of Acts. Acts chapter 3, beginning with verse 11. And here is what the Word of God says. It says, While he clung to Peter and John, all the people ran to gather to them in the portico called Solomon's portico. Utterly astonished, when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. When, when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this, or why do you stare at us, as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our forefathers. 
has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to give, uh, have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him his perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out. Let's go to God in prayer. Almighty and gracious God, we are grateful for the word of God that you have placed before us, your holy and righteous word. Your word that goes before us, behind us, beside us, and lives within us. Your word that corrects, your word that admonishes, your word that encourages and inspires. This morning, O oh God, we praise you for all that you have done, even unto this day. We're grateful for the lives of those who have proclaimed your word from this pulpit. And those who continue this day. So today, O oh God, may your words be my words. May your thoughts be my thoughts. May all of our hearts be tuned to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. See, y'all thought I was going to forget that part, didn't you? But I didn't. So. So here we are, and, and you're going to have to forgive me. I may pick up the microphone and walk a little bit. I, I, you know, I, I don't typically stay grounded here at the pulpit. So if I walk a little bit, you'll just have to bear with me. But sometimes, I say sometimes, every Sunday, every time I get to proclaim the Word of God, I get a little excited. I don't know about you. We get a little excited about the Word of God, and this today is no different. You see, we've been on this journey. I know that you walk through Ash Wednesday. You come from Ash Wednesday all through Lent, getting into the cracks and crevices of your life to, to remove the things that got in the way of your relationship with God and with others. I know you've done the hard work so that leading up to Easter, leading up to Resurrection Sunday, you were ready. You were ready to be cleaned by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And by the blood of his sacrifice on the cross. And so we walk up to Palm Sunday and we come celebrating on Palm Sunday, waving palm branches and palm leaves. And we place them on the altar and and we're singing Hosanna in the highest heaven. Hosanna for the king has come, the king of the Jews. He is coming into Jerusalem all the while at the other side of Jerusalem, at the other entrance of Jerusalem. His pilot coming in, exerting his authority and showing his force. Just as Jesus is coming into the city, proclaiming the coming of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We're proclaiming, we're, we're right there with him, we're proclaiming. And then, not a few days later, we are with the crowd yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Give us Barabbas instead of Jesus. Give us the murderer instead of the one who has changed our lives, who has changed our world, the one who has came, has come into the world to to save and to seek the lost. And so it was before that, though, we get to, to, to... Monday Thursday and we are we are in the same room with Jesus and he's washing our feet telling us to do the same that he has done to us unto others to seek and to serve others in that same way and then we come to Good Friday and 
we bear witness to all the horrific things that happen between Monday Thursday and Good Friday evening when Jesus is on the cross and he breathes his last and he says, it is finished. And we wait in silence, in darkness. We wait in the silence of our own thoughts and our own questions and our own uncertainty at what is happening. The Savior of the world is dead. How can this be? And yet we wait. And I know that y'all walked with the ladies going to the tomb. We read from Mark at, at, at Reeves Chapel. We read from Mark chapter 16 where Mary Magdalene, the Mary the mother of James and Salome, they were walking along. And as they're walking, they're asking the question. I watched your message. And you talked about the stones. You shared stones with folks. I don't know how many of you brought them today, but do you see them every single time you, you, you hold them in your hand or you have them in your, in your bathroom on the counter or, or on the kitchen counter before you walk out of the house? And it's a reminder of just how Amazing it was that Jesus rolled the stone away. Amen. And as the ladies are walking, they're asking the question, right? Who will roll the stone away for us? We're not big enough. The stone is too great. And yet as we walk, we're walking with them in our own lives and we're seeing the, our own stones that the closer we get, the bigger that they get, that, that they're on our road of life. Maybe it's uncertainty, maybe, maybe it's infidelity, maybe, maybe it's the loss of a job or, or the loss of a, a loved one that's closest to us, but, but we're walking and the, and the stone seems so huge. And we're asking the question, who will roll the stone away? <laughs> We don't have to wonder anymore because Jesus goes before us to roll the stone away. The stones in our life that, that, that keep us from, from realizing the love and the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness that God has for us. They are removed. They are as far as the east is from the west. He tells us, if only, if only we would believe. And so then we come last week, I preached on Acts of the Apostles, in, out of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, and we talked about how now life was, was starting to, to come together, right? Kind of like here, where, where people have lifted you up, Marcy, and they, they've provided for you, not only physically, but mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. You, you have been provided for. You have cared for her. For her and for her family, for her friends. You've cared for those in need. You've lifted them up in prayer every Sunday. That's what it means to be in community. In Acts chapter 4, of course, we're past 2. We're working our way backwards from 4 all the way to 2, you know, because chapter 2 is, of course, Pentecost, the, the beginning of the church, the beginning of, of the Holy Spirit filling a place so that all may hear and understand the glory and the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we're not there yet. So this Sunday, we, we, the, everybody's provided for to, that no one had need in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. They were all of one soul and heart, one heart and mind. Just like here. We're all of one heart and mind. That heart and mind is to seek and to save lost, to, to offer Jesus to the world around you. To make Jesus' name known. And, and that the love that God showed through the act of salvation, through Jesus Christ on the cross, and, and the glorification of him in the empty tomb that he sits at God's right hand. That is what we're supposed to do. But, but, we, but that's how we live in community. That's how we live in community. And then we come to our, our, our scripture lesson this morning. I'll back it up just a little bit. The beginning of chapter 3 finds the disciples. They're, they're going and doing what they normally do. If you read 1 through 11 or 1 through 10, you'll see that they're going to the temple. They're going to pray as they normally did. They're Jews. They didn't just forget their traditions. They didn't just forget their livelihood. They didn't forget how God had intervened in their lives already through the history of 
of the Old Testament, through the history of the Hebrew Bible, the history that they know themselves frontwards to backwards, that they've known their whole lives. They saw how God intervened in their lives. They remember because they were just at Passover. They remember that that God intervened in their lives, brought them out of slavery and captivity and delivered them into the promised land. So they're going up to the temple to pray and they encounter a man who has been crippled since birth. His family and friends bring him to the, to the gate called Beautiful and lay him there and he asks for alms day after day after day. And I would imagine if the disciples are like us or if we're like the disciples, if there's somebody that sits out and, and, and in front of the temple or in front of the church and, and begs for money day after day after day, we, we might become numb to them. I know we do on the side of the road, right? So when you're driving and you notice somebody holding up a sign needing help, you, we become numb to the fact that, that people need help and we judge them for where they are in life and that they're standing on the side of the road with a sign instead of somewhere at work, even though whatever it was that brought them there is still the stone that, they, that has not been removed from their life. And so the disciples are walking up and they, he, the, the, the man reaches up and begs for, for alms, begs for money. Peter stops and stares intently at him. When he stops and stares intently at him, he says, silver and gold I do not have. But I give to you what I do have. Rise and walk in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He takes his hand and he walks. <laughs> such a miracle, such a miraculous moment in time, a, a sacred moment where, where the divine meets with humanity. It's, a, it's that moment where, where only Jesus can be proclaimed because... It's not what we do, but it is what God does through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so as happens, a crowd starts to to, to gather because, because the, the man, he, he's just been healed. He hasn't walked his whole life. He doesn't know what it means to stand up and to be joyful. He doesn't just stand up, though, Marcy. He doesn't stand up. He runs, he jumps, and he praises God. For all that God has blessed him with, healing him, removing the stone so he can walk. So this man is walking and jumping and running in church. I remember when I was a kid, granddad told me never to run in church. I never have run in church because me and my brother were playing. If, if we were little and we were playing and granddad was trying to get ready for 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 service and he was up at the pulpit and he came, comes out of the pulpit and he, he runs down there and he, he says, we don't run in church. I was too young to point him to, to, that, to that passage of scripture in Acts, you know, because, you know, he would have known that I was right and I, he was wrong. He wouldn't have known. It would have gotten worse. So, so as pastors do, they take the opportunity when there is something unbelievable happening to preach. Peter begins to preach. Is where, that's where we find here. I've, I backed it up to 11 so we know that we're on the eastern side of the temple. We're at Solomon's portico, Solomon's porch. On the east side of the temple. The people were utterly astonished, the word of God says. And it says that when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. And he told them, he said, wait, wait a minute. Why, why are you staring at us? Why, why are you looking here? You see, this... This that has happened, this healing that has happened, is nothing to do with us. All we are is the vessel. All we are is open to the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And when we work in, in the Holy Spirit, when we're working in that spirit mode, then that means that anything is open and available to God. And God is going to do what God is going to do Amen. in that moment. And so he says it's not because of us, but it's because of Jesus. He says it this way. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Why do you stare at us as though by our own power or our own piety, our own spirituality, our own doing, we had made him walk? You see, he reminds them 
of who and whose they are. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The God of our ancestors. The same one who raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the one who raised this man up from his uh, paralyzed state and he is walking and jumping and running. But that's not all. You see, he reminded them of just who they were a few short weeks ago. You, the ones who handed over the author of life. You, once you ask, when I asked to have, uh, whether you were going to have the murderer or the righteous one, he says, but you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. I don't know how many of you are basketball fans. I, I coach, and, I coach uh, basketball, boys basketball at Cooper, and, uh, and love it. I, I, I love interacting with the, with the young men, getting them to achieve things that they didn't believe that they could achieve in the beginning. It, it's, one, it's what draws coaches and teachers to be coaches and teachers. But last year, I remember, I'm not a big fan of this young man. But Nike had a promotion for LeBron James. And on the side, in Cleveland, Ohio, on the side of a building, it's LeBron James with his arms stretched out this way, and it says, we are witnesses. What they're saying is that we're witnessing greatness. We're witnessing something that has never happened before. Me, however, I am a Gen, Gen X kid. I grew up in the 70s and 80s. And I beg to differ because Michael Jordan has done that before. <laughs> That's just me, though. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Michael Jordan fan. I don't know if y'all could, I mean, <laughs> when they start talking about, you know, the, the, uh, the 23 and Me stuff, you know, with the, with the DNA stuff, I thought that was 23 and Michael. <laughs> me and Michael, you know, I thought that was, just, that was just me, though, so. But as we witness what LeBron James, it's nothing in comparison to what Jesus Christ did through the cross and the empty tomb. Amen. We bear witness to that. We who gather here today bear witness to that fact. That Jesus Christ died for all of our sins. He took with him into the grave the sins and, the, and the, the death of people in this world and was raised on the third day as we sat in silence and darkness and we walked to the empty tomb that first Easter Sunday with the, with the, the ladies and wondering who's going to roll the stone. We didn't have to know because he was not there. He was risen. He is risen. But we too were like those Jews that week before where on one hand we're saying praise him, praise him. He comes in the name of the Lord. He who comes in the name of the Lord. And then by the end of the week we were yelling crucify him. We know the end of the story now. What about you? What do you witness to. What, what have you witnessed in your life? See, that's our job. We, we talk about it after Easter. We're, we're like, oh, we had this big build up to Easter and all of a sudden now it's, now, now it's like, now what? Where do we go from here? How do we live? What are we supposed to be like? How do we get to the place in chapter 4, 32 through 35 where, where we are all in one accord and nobody needed anything? Because Jesus provided it all. How do we get to that place in this church, in this community, and in our world? It's that we bear witness to the love and the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ in our lives, who has removed the stones from our path so that we don't have to move them ourselves. We bear witness to the very fact that, that he has worked in our lives in various ways. Maybe it was a job. Maybe it was a, a marriage. Maybe it was uh, the health of a, of a child or, or the graduation of, of a child that didn't even think that they could, could make it through 12 years of school. Or 
Or maybe it's a single mom who, who raises three kids on her own, but all know of Jesus. Maybe it's you who are here today that bear witness to God's love in your life through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Today is the day that you reach down and pick up the crippled's hand and say, walk in the name of Jesus Christ. For surely there is someone in your life who needs that touch, who needs that gaze, who needs God's presence. But we might, we've got to keep the main thing the main thing. As you bear witness to what Jesus has done in your life, who Jesus is in your life. It's not hard. It's not, it's not uh, difficult. We make it harder than it has to be. A friend, uh, our neighbor, his name is Jimmy. Jimmy, uh, he and his family used to live in Cooper. They live right across the street from us. As you can tell, I don't meet people very easily. I don't like to talk. <laughs> kind of shy. But Jimmy and I haven't talked a lot, and so I walk over to his house last week, and we're talking, and, and he, he says, I know you're a pastor, and I, we just haven't had time to talk. He says, let me tell you about something. His son is actually, one of his sons is an associate pastor at a church in Sulphur Springs, right around the corner from where we live, and he said, I want to tell you something. He said, I used to have trouble talking about Jesus. He said, not that I had trouble talking about Jesus, but, but my heart ached when I wasn't able to tell people about Jesus. He said, let me give you an example. He said, he said like, I'd be up at the, at the gas station, and I'm pumping gas over here, and on the other island, there's another guy that's there, and he's getting the stuff out of his, uh, cleaning his truck out while he's getting gas, and, and there's an opportunity for me to share Jesus with him, and and yet I get wound up in what I'm doing and, and trying to get my gas, and he drives off without me talking to him. He said, it, it used to hurt me. He said, Kelly, it used to hurt me a lot. He said, it used, it used to be like I, I couldn't function again for a long time because it, it would hurt my heart that I wasn't able to share Jesus with him. He says, but as I been walking with God and, and, and reading and, and, and growing in my faith, he said, finally, I, I decided, I discovered that the sovereignty of God is going to take care of those people that I miss. That somewhere, somehow, they're going to hear of the love of Jesus Christ wherever that they go. It, may, it doesn't always have to be me. Because even Scripture tells us that if, even if you don't proclaim the goodness of God, the rocks will cry out. So he said, but I started doing something different. Now, I'm not telling you that you have to do this. Don't, don't hear that. But what he started doing is that anybody in here get spam calls on your cell phone? Anybody? Am I just? Okay, so we're just witnessing. All right, so we're witnesses to that too. But what he has been doing is he felt like God was telling him instead of hitting the end button or sending them to voicemail or not answering at all, he started answering the phone. And of course, they're like, hey, Jimmy, do you have a second to talk? And he said, I'll, I'll stay on the phone and listen to what you have to say if at the end of your spiel, I get to offer something to you. And at first, people would hang up because they would, the, guy, the people would hang up because, oh, you're a Christian. Oh, yeah, and click, they would hang up. He said, but then there have been a couple of them that have stayed on the line, and he's gotten to share Jesus and how Jesus has impacted his life and changed his life and his trajectory and, and, and the motion of his life and that he wants everybody to know about the love of Jesus. And he communicates with a young man in the Middle East now, quite regularly as a matter of fact, and they're walking through the New Testament together 30 minutes at a time on a phone call from around the world. You see, it's not hard. You just have to be willing and open to do it. You see, the disciples were willing and open as they walked up to the, to the temple that day. They were willing and open. Instead of walking by as they normally did, they were willing and open, willing and open to sharing what they had. That's what, that's what Peter says. Silver and gold I do not have. 
I'm going to give you what I do have, and that's Jesus. How easy is that? Oh, but it comes with some strings attached, right? Because, because then people will know that you are a Christ follower. Then you, they'll know that you're a disciple of Jesus. Then they'll know you're a Christian. How wonderful it is to be called a Christian, a Christ follower, a disciple. But that's not the main point here. I'm going to leave you with this, and that is at the end of it, verse 17. It says, and now, friends, and now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through the, all the prophets that the Messiah, his Messiah, would suffer. Right here in 19, repent. Repent, therefore. What God has done in your life, how can you keep it to yourself? How can this place or any place, house of worship, not be filled with people who are excited and, and inspired to share God's good news with the world around them? Why will we keep that hope to ourselves? Why would we keep the love of Jesus to ourselves. You see, that's the good news for today. The good news for today is that no matter where you go, no matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what trouble you've had, no matter what circumstances have prevailed in your life, that today's a new day. Your walk with God is new today. Being here in this place, hearing the love of Jesus Christ being proclaimed from the word of God. Your life has changed today. Jesus has reached down his hand to you. Whatever, whatever healing needed to take place in your life. Whether physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, that healing is taken place by your hearing his word proclaimed. So what are you going to do with it? The challenge is to go out into the world proclaiming the gospel that Jesus Christ is risen. That Jesus Christ crucified and risen for, is the hope of the world. And that not by our own doing, but by the grace of God through Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can dance and sing and praise about God's love in our life so that those around us will ask, what is, what is it that you have? Why are you the way you are? Sometimes it's not what we say, but it's how we live. So the two challenges I have for you this week one, no matter where you go, no matter who you talk to, tell them about Jesus. And I don't mean you have to go, have you heard about Jesus? It doesn't have to be all of that. But what it, does, what it can be is, let me tell you how Jesus has been in my life. I was a wreck. When my grandfather died when I was a teenager, when I was in high school, my grandfather died. The only man that I had known, the only man that I had loved and known as a father, died when I needed him the most and I felt like it was my fault and so for years I ran away from God angry because he took the only person that I knew as my father away from me that's the testimony because God kept pursuing God kept chasing me God kept wanting to have me stand here in this place this morning to say that Jesus Christ loves you right where you are is willing to walk with you, removing the obstacles in your path. No matter how thick, how big, how wide, how deep they go, Jesus will remove them as far as the east is from the west. 
so that you too can proclaim with your voice and with your life that Jesus Christ is risen. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious and merciful God, we are grateful for your son Jesus Christ, our example and redeemer. We are grateful for your love in our lives, for the forgiveness of sins that you have given unto us. Oh God, we pray that you would go with us as you challenge us to be your hands and feet and voice in this world. You challenge us. You challenge us to be who you've called us to be, disciples, proclaiming your good news. Go with us, oh God. By the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to reach into people's lives, picking them up out of the misery and the mire and the muck and helping them to walk with us as we grow in community, in faith, and in love. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen, amen. and amen. I don't know what we do next. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I would ask it as you, if you would stand as we join in our hymn of commitment, God of grace and God of glory, verses five, number 577, verses 1 and 4. If you need that prayer this morning, the altar is open. I am here to pray with you. Or maybe right there in your, in your own pew, Jesus Christ is calling to you today, his grace and his glory are filling you just as you hear this morning. Let us stand and sing. God of grace and God of glory, on thy people pour thy power. Crown thine ancient church story. Bring her blood to glorious flower. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour, for the facing of this hour. Save us from resignation to the evils we deplore. Let the search for thy salvation be our glory evermore. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, serving thee whom we adore, serving thee whom we adore. Receive this dismissal with blessing. May the grace and the peace and the strength of our Lord Jesus Christ go with you. Go with you throughout this world, that no matter where you go, you proclaim his goodness in your life so that others may know the love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness of Jesus Christ, our Lord. May it be so this day and every day. Amen. Amen.